Good afternoon, everyone. This is our Black Women's Health Across the Lifespan, a three-part collaborative learning series. This is session one, Black Adolescent and Young Women, Sex Positivity, Sex Positivity and Healthy Relationships. Next slide, please. This course has, oh, I'm sorry, this is the Effie Berry Training Institute, and this program is funded by um, Department of Health, HIV, AIDS, Hepatitis, and TB Administration, HOSTA. This course has CME, CE accreditation provided to you jointly by Postgraduate Institute for Medicine and Health HIV. There, there are no disclosures from myself, Hannah, or any of the panelists, uh, we, you should have received CME CE handouts on how to claim your credits. We are encouraging everyone to complete the evaluation that is set whether you are claiming your credits or not. We are delighted to provide credits for this three-part series. As I said, there are no disclosures from any of the panel members. This is just reiterate how to request your credits. And these are the type of credits we are providing throughout this series. Thank you. I just want to welcome everyone. We are super excited about this series today. And um, Hannah and I just want to give you a little background of how this came to be. And this series was truly born out of the reflection of what we're currently experiencing. Um, as myself, and I'm sure everyone that's listening, um, COVID-19, the racial justice movements have taken a toll on us. And we thought this was the perfect time that we need some substantive, real conversation around Black women and to help move us forward. So we are looking forward to creating a platform to discuss all the complexities around Black women, their health, culture, strength, and their vulnerabilities across the lifespan. So I thank you guys in for a treat. We have a wonderful panel and welcome everybody. Hannah, you want to add to that? Because Hannah and I actually, um, you know, we talked so much with the Health HIV team about what we wanted this series to look like. Hannah, you have to unmute yourself. That was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to say that we wanted to create an opportunity and a platform to have real discussions around Black women's health. Because a lot of times we have conversations about inequities and you know issues with health disparities but we don't specifically talk about black women and so we wanted to make sure that we were having a conversation that was specific to black women across a lifespan from young ages when we're emerging adults up into reproductive health throughout middle aged and older adulthood and so this was something that seemed very timely considering everything that was happening around us and so we look forward to doing something a little bit different that's not your typical webinar we'll do a, a quick uh, sort of uh, discussion in the beginning where we'll open uh, some of the topics that we'll talk about a little bit later but we really just wanted to create an opportunity to have real conversations about what we're experiencing right now so um, we are grateful to help HIV and to the Department of Health our funders in order to do this sort of work so thank you thank you Hannah and I love this slide. <laughs> okay. Oh, so I was going to actually introduce. Uh, yes. Um, so actually, my name is Lisa Frederick, and I am one of your co-moderators. And um, I am lucky to co-moderate with my friend and colleague, Hannah Tessima. Uh, Hannah Tessima is a public health practitioner with 14 years of experience in managing national capacity building training and technical assistance programs on HIV AIDS prevention, care and treatment. She has worked with communities at increased risk for HIV throughout the US and globally. She is a doctoral candidate in public health, health behavior at GW Milken Institute School of Public Health. She, hold a, she holds a global master's in public health and epidemiology from NYU and a master's in social policy and program evaluation from the University of Michigan. Hannah is currently conducting research on PrEP and contraception uptake among Black women here in DC and teaching a social 
and behavior health course on designing evidence-based interventions to um, MPH students at GW. Yes. Impressive, Hannah. Thank you, Lisa. And I just wanted to also introduce Lisa to the group. Uh, Lisa has been uh, working at Health HIV as a capacity building manager. She provides capacity building services on organizational uh, sustainability, programmatic infrastructure, as well as systems development. She's been doing this for the past 20 years, uh, working in HIV and viral hepatitis, as well as sexual health. Lisa has been providing HIV technical assistance and capacity building through Elton John and Elizabeth Taylor funded national HIV TA and capacity building programs throughout the Southern US uh, and working to improve health outcomes for black and brown communities. She's led uh, the development and implementation of a New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Health Literacy in HIV and older adults program uh, focused on HIV testing and sexual health messaging. Her expertise extends to translational educational research programs, which resulted in the development of an HIV and older women's program, focusing on uh, intimate partner violence, menopause, sexual health, and resilience. So a lot of these topics that we've been sort of working on over these past several years will come up over these next few days. So that's a bit of a background about us, but let's go ahead and jump into the topic for today, which is really on youth and adolescence. So, we wanted to first start off by defining this group and characterizing this group a bit uh, just from a, a standpoint of human development. And so we have had some scholars in psychology who started to define what human development looks like across the different stages. And so, uh, you know, when you look at the different stages, you might think that they appear very linear and it goes like one step to the other to the other. And sometimes it doesn't always work that way. So there are some critiques, but just to give us a broad framework um, from which to sort of look at, uh, we, we went to Erickson and Havikhurst to look at human development. And when you look at terminology for adolescence, you might hear about the adolescent transition or adolescence or emerging adults. And that's the population that we're talking about today. So depending on who you ask and what resource you, you go to, you'll see that that age range is usually between the years of age 10 to 20, these are the preteen and the teen years. And some of the key developmental considerations within this group are that they're searching for a sense of self, a personal identity, um, ex exploring what their personal values and beliefs and goals might be, uh, defining what they are, developing sexual and occupational identity. What do I want to be when I grow up? Who am I exactly? Um, and the key question that comes up within this group is who am I and where am I going? Okay, so adolescent development. So if we look a little bit further into what, what it looks like within this age group, we're talking about folks that are changing uh, both cognitively, physically, sexually, and otherwise. So physical sense of self changes due to hormonal changes within this age group. There are new intellectual abilities that, that are uh, growing within this time. Oh um, increased cognitive demands at school are happening. There's an expanded uh, verbal skill as we develop within this age. And then this key piece about a personal sense of identity is really important, and that's going to come up as we go a little bit further. Oh, uh, also establishing occupational goals. What do I want to be when I grow up? Many of us are still working on that as well. Emotional and psychological independence from parents is a big one. Developing stable and productive peer relationships. What do those look like? And then managing her own sexuality, if we're talking about young girls. Okay, so... So as young girls transition from childhood to adulthood, confidence might be an issue. Maybe there's a lack of confidence about how they're perceived in the world. Do I wanna fit in? Do I wanna stand out? And what does that look like? In order to figure that out, that might require some exploration or some experimenting with different behaviors, different activities. Uh, and that might make parents nervous sometimes. I know that tends to come up a lot. Why is my child doing this? Well, why, why are they behaving this way? And a lot of it has to do with them defining who, who they are and figuring that part out. So there are many influencers in the process of this exploration, especially in the times that we're living in right now with social media. But of course, we've got the friends, we've got social media, parents and pop culture and teachers and schoolmates, and you get the point, family. There are a lot of different influencers, influences coming from all different directions, television, society. And on top of all of that, as if that was not enough, Adolescence, especially for Black adolescents, is, is, is really trying because they're growing and developing within a system that's inherently racist. And so how does that work? And what are the implications of that? What does that mean in terms of health outcomes? 
So there are a lot of things that we have to explore and discuss and figure out. And really with these sessions, what we wanna do is get to a place, not only where we're talking about these issues, but where we talk about a path forward afterwards. What do we do as a result of this? So Bridget Davis, who's a PhD candidate at Harvard, has been doing some research around discrimination in health. So if we look at that, look at that pathway and we first define discrimination as we're referring to an action or an inaction that wouldn't have occurred had the target been perceived part of a, a broader group or another group, um, discriminatory actions, now this is really key here, and this comes up quite a lot and has been part of media a lot these days in terms of implicit bias, but discriminatory action may be intentional, and it may also be unintentional. So nevertheless, for the target uh, of discrimination, apologize and having a phone call coming through. Okay, gotta love these Zoom times. Okay, so discriminatory action may be intentional or unintentional. Nevertheless, for the target of the discrimination, the experience itself is still detrimental, whether the person intended to do it or not. So that's something that's really key that we have to focus on and we can't get caught up in the, the piece that the person just didn't know because we still feel it in the end is, is the idea here. So research suggests that discrimination impacts health primarily through three major pathways. And so those are psychosocial stress, access to health and social resources, and lastly, violence and bodily harm. Okay, so we've got a statement here from just a couple of months ago in June from the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine and what they're saying here is that as adolescent health clinicians and researchers, SAHM members understand that racism is a core social determinant of health that has far reaching effects on health and well being. All levels of racism, whether institutionalized, personally mediated, and internalized, drive disparities in health outcomes. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that internalized piece and what that might look like for youth. Experiences of discrimination lead to internalized negative stereotypes that preclude the development of a positive identity and may lead to depression, anxiety, and suicide even. Um, and so when we look at that piece about internalized negative stereotypes precluding the development of a positive identity, remember when we were looking back at the healthy development within this age group, a lot of it is, a lot of it is focused on creating a positive self-identity or creating who you are. So living in a, in a place that's uh, in a system that's inherently racist makes things very challenging. Okay, so we are at our first polling question. So I will pose a question to you. So here it is. In the United States, adults view black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers starting as young as age 10. Is that true or false? I'll give you, you know, what do we say, about 30 seconds? We got a little bit of time. If you haven't yet answered, please do. True or false? About 30 seconds. So there's uh, someone's asking, where do I answer the poll? You just, um, there's two bubbles there that say true or false. So you just click on one or the other. Hopefully. Uh, well, some folks are saying they don't see the bubbles. Okay. Well, if you don't see the bubbles, then just sort of try to have the answer in your mind. So the question is, in the United States, adults view black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers, starting as young as age 10. Is that true or false? It's true. All right, so I think we can go ahead and close the poll in question. All right, so 93% said true. And unfortunately, this was a trick question. So the answer is actually false because it's even younger than 10. The answer is five. Yes, yes. That's amazing. Yeah, so it's even younger than we thought. And so we're going to show you a short video about adultification, which really talks about how serious of an issue this is, particularly for Black girls. And so, sorry to, to throw in the trick question, but I just really wanted you to see the impact of how young this is really starting. So let's go ahead into the next slide, and we'll watch a short video about adultification from Georgetown, which was really well made. Great video, Han. This is a great video. They're in for a treat here. Yeah. Thank you. 
In the United States, adults view black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers starting as young as five years old. This is known as adultification bias. A groundbreaking study by Georgetown Law Center on poverty and inequality found that adults believe black girls need less nurturing, less protection, less support, and less comforting. And related studies show that black girls are punished at a disproportionate rate in schools and the juvenile justice system. These statistics reveal an alarming reality, but do they reflect the experiences of black girls and women? We conducted focus groups across the country to hear about their lived experiences. They told us that black girls often face higher standards. I feel like you cannot make mistakes as a black girl. All kids make mistakes, but in similar situations, black girls are treated differently. A white girl's mistakes might be met with sympathy and understanding. But time after time, black girls are punished instead because they are held to a more adult standard of behavior. Everybody says, oh, you should have known better. They're not even acting like we're children. Those different standards may be linked to harsher treatment for Black girls. We heard stories about adults holding Black girls more accountable for their actions. During a four-square game at school, one of the balls hit a girl in the face. We heard stories about adults holding Black girls more accountable for their actions. During a four-square game at school, one of the balls hit a girl in the face. They just threw a salt and battery on my record. I had to transfer to a different school, but the other school didn't want to take me because I had a salt and battery on my record. In our focus groups, they overwhelmingly agreed that adultification bias is associated with punitive treatment. Negative stereotypes of Black women are also projected onto Black girls, which can contribute to adultification bias. Focus group participants overwhelmingly confirmed that even when they were young, adults viewed them as less innocent than their white peers. There was this assumption that you're cussing people out, drinking, and having sex. But since I never thought about that before, they were basically introducing me to those topics right then. In sixth grade, the school nurse asked my aunt if I was sexually active. And I was like, at the time, like, what? Nobody has sex. Like, I didn't know anyone that had sex. She would never think to ask my white friend that. Black women and girls also told us that adults stereotype them as too loud, aggressive, or angry, and see Black girls' actions as threatening and disrespectful. Adultification bias erases the distinction between childhood and adulthood, which can have a harmful impact on the lives of Black girls. We need to work together to end adultification bias. These findings in our new study provide key insights into the lived experiences of Black girls and an inspiration to drive change. We are committed to raising awareness and promoting the need for cultural competency training and age-appropriate treatment of Black girls so they can have a childhood in a safe, supportive, and nurturing environment where they can dream, lead, and thrive. As Black girls, we still need to be protected. It doesn't matter if we're Black or not. Be part of the change. I hope you all enjoyed that video because a lot of times we don't really talk about, we didn't really have a term for that. What does that exactly mean? Adultification, is that something commonly used? Is that something that people talk about a lot? And that's really, really, really relevant to black women or black girls, as you can see. Um, if we can go back to the slides, there we go. Okay, so thinking about everything that was said in that video, and we won't go into detail because we'll have time to talk about it afterwards, but there's this concept of internalized negative stereotypes. Imagine black girls going through all of this and starting to internalize that and say, well, maybe, maybe I am the way that they're saying that I am. 
And that's really problematic and that can have really negative uh, implications and can lead to really negative health outcomes, which we'll get to. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, teen pregnancy. So teen pregnancy rates have declined significantly over time since the 90s, early 2000s. It's gone down a lot. And um, there was a study that came out that showed uh, that the rates were declining significantly from 2014 after shows like 16 and Pregnant and Teen Mom showing cautionary tales of teenage pregnancy and how difficult it can be. And they actually said that that contributed to a third of the drop in teen pregnancy rates. Despite that, Black girls still have significantly higher rates of teen pregnancy than their white counterparts. And I want us to really think about why that might be. Um, and moving to the next slide here. It looks like I don't have control of the slides. Okay. Oh no. Okay. So teen pregnancy predictors. So there are a lot of predictors here, but just looking at, at some of the work from Dr. Gail Wyatt over at UCLA, um, she's saying here that poverty plays a big role in high teen birth rates, as does geography. Southern states, which tend to be poorer, have higher rates of HIV infections, also report higher number of teen births. Southern states, when we think about it, are also typically states that uh, tend to maybe focus on abstinence only education or are states that maybe didn't expand Medicaid. And so access to healthcare might be a little bit different where people have less ability to get the quality of care that they really need. So education and access to contraceptives play a large role in teen pregnancy rates continuing to proliferate, especially among black girls. And poor teens of color are less likely to have access to quality health care, contraceptive services, are much like, more likely to live in neighborhoods where jobs and opportunities for advancement are scarce. And so if this mentality of, you know, there's no way that I'm going to get out of this place that I live in, whether it's this neighborhood or, or where I am, if I can't advance economically, then maybe I don't have any other options. And so having, having children younger might seem like the direction to go. And so that's, uh, that comes from some of Dr. Wyatt's work there. Uh, I'm going to pose another polling question here to you before we reveal some statistics. So let's go ahead and bring that up. So the second polling question here is about uh, teen pregnancy. So in the US, approximately 7,300 girls between the ages of 13 to 24 are, oh, it's about HIV, sorry, are living with HIV. What percentage are black girls? Is it 15%, 23%, 55%, or 62%? What percentage of girls aged 13 to 24 that are living with HIV are black? I see some people typing it in the box. If you can, click on the poll. Um, either way at this point, however you're able to access it. Seeing lots of different answers here. I'll give you maybe about 10, 15 more seconds. If you haven't answered, please do. In the U.S., approximately 7,300 girls between the ages of 13 to 24 are living with HIV. What percentage are Black girls? 15%, 23%, 55%, or 62%? Okay, I think we can wrap, wrap up the poll. And the answer, okay, well, let's see. First, people said mostly 55%. That was the majority. Um, well, between 23 and 55%. And unfortunately, those that said 62% were correct. The 24% that answered that way. The answer is actually 62%. Uh, while we wish that wasn't the case, it is significantly higher than uh, girls and other uh, racial groups. So let me see if I can get to the next slide. There we go. Okay. So as I mentioned before, teen birth rates have declined significantly, but the rates of teen pregnancy among black girls is more than double of that of their white counterparts. Now, when we talk about HIV between the ages of 13 to 24, black girls have a significantly higher prevalence of HIV. Now we can compare and look at other groups. Um, see, we got the 62% here when we look at Hispanic Latino within this age group, girls 19% versus 13% among whites. 
uh, multiple races, 5%, Asian, 1%, uh, Native Hawaiian, other Pacific Islander, less than 1%. So we see that's a huge, huge disparity. Uh, and that's still something, even though we talk about how much, you know, pregnancy rates have declined or HIV uh, incidence has even declined over time, this is still an issue within this group. And so we really need to focus on why that is. And I think this might be my last slide here, but really my point was just to set, sort of set the stage before we jump into this conversation. And so I wanted to talk about ACE scores quickly because ACE and ACE scores refer to adverse childhood experiences. That's what ACE is. And these ACE scores are really important because they impact life in the long run for a woman across her lifespan. So black adolescents and young adults are at higher risk for the most physically harmful forms of violence compared with whites. And those are homicides, fights with injuries, aggravated assault. Um, and black adults report exposure to a higher number of, of ACE issues, adverse childhood experiences than whites. Um, and these adverse childhood experiences were positively associated with increased odds of self-reported coronary heart disease, fair or poor physical health, experiencing frequent mental distress, heavy drinking, current smoking, and I'm sure this list can go on and on and on, that there are so many negative health outcomes that can result over time after having experienced uh, these negative things. And stress is something that's really important that sort of weighs on the body and creates inflammation and can lead to some of these negative health outcomes. And so how do we address these sorts of systemic issues? And I think that might be part of our, our discussion as we move forward. Um, so let's see yes someone is asking if groups are muted i believe that groups are muted so i think this might be uh yeah so that's our last bit of content here but when we were talking in our in our group of, of panelists and experts we, we brought some subject matter experts to the table here today we really tried to identify what are these priority areas because we had a long list of things we wanted to talk about and we would just wouldn't have had long list. About everything. it was very very long and so you know, Dr. Brian, Adrian, they were like, nope, too long, too long. So we just had, had to narrow it down a little bit. And so these are the few that we came up with, especially living in the times of COVID right now. What are the implications of COVID-19 for Black adolescents? Um, what are some of the things that people are concerned about there? Um, also, uh, what are some of the health promotion and disease prevention needs for this population of Black youth and emerging adults? Um, and then also this bit about conversations around sex and sexuality, you know, are we even having these kind of conversations? What type of language are we using? If we do have these conversations, what does that look like for this group? Uh, some of the psychosocial challenges faced, faced by this group because they're really unique and different and there are nuances between each one of the age groups. And so we wanted to focus on what those psychosocial challenges look like for this group. And then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, a path forward. What do we do now that we know all of this, which we do know all of this and we're just opening the discussion, what can we advise for black youth, for providers, whether clinical or non-clinical pro providers to do moving forward, those people that are working with youth? Uh, so we want to end on, on a positive forward, moving forward note. So that's where we are. So we want to go ahead and open the panel discussion. Let me introduce our panelists here. So we have with us Dr. Yafet Bryant. She is the Director of Mental Health Services for the Ryan White Program at Children's National Hospital here in Washington, D.C. She's an assistant professor at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences in the Department of Pediatrics and Psychology and Behavioral Sciences. She has almost 20 years of professional experience in clinical services, research, and management. She's worked in the field of HIV and mental health for 10 years. Dr. Bryant has a special interest in adolescents, young adulthood, and HIV. Then we've got here with us Adrian Barksdale. She is a licensed social worker who currently works for DC Health as a program coordinator for adolescent pregnancy prevention. She graduated from Howard University with her master's in social work with a concentration in community, administration, and policy practice. She has a background in sexual and reproductive health with a focus in adolescent development and LGBTQ communities. Adrian currently oversees the Youth Advisory Board for DC Health Sex Is campaign. Um, and she uh, conducts trusted adult training with schools, parent guardians, and community members. Adrian has conducted workshops and spoke at conferences about the importance of reproductive health education for adolescents. So we have a really wonderful panel here with a lot of experience. And so we just really wanted to start the conversation after we set the, set the stage uh, to hear from them about folks that they're working with, what their experience has been like, and then what do we do about all of this? So the first question that I really wanted to pose to our subject matter experts 
Uh, and it looks like someone says, I love the sex is campaign. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question I wanted to ask was really about COVID and in the times that we're living in that are so unanticipated and you know, nobody could have really, well, at some point we could have seen it coming, but you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? We didn't expect this last year. Um, so what are some of the implications of COVID among black women within this age group? And so I'd first pose that to Dr. Bryan and then to Adrian. All right, thank you, Hannah. Um, what a timely and evolving question as this pandemic rolls on. Um, I just want to set the context in terms of the youth that I work with. So um, my perspective is as a psychologist working with um, young African American women who are living with HIV um, or AIDS. Um, and most of them um, are perinatally infected. Um, and most of them are cisgender and identify as heterosexual. So just wanted to give those qualifiers. Um, so initially, um, a lot of our young women were really afraid, just like everybody else. So they have, just to be honest, they have the same experiences as most people on top of, you know, making it through adolescence and living with HIV or AIDS. And so in the beginning, there was a lot of fear of contagion, um, a lot of fear of, wow, what will happen to me because I have a com compromised immune system. Um, if I catch COVID, what will happen to me? An artifact of this, which was a great artifact, we had increased adherence to medication. So some of our young women who were falling off on taking their medications really stepped up, um, especially in the beginning of this pandemic, and really um, took their medications and experienced some uh, really good um, outcomes in terms of their health. Um, and as the pandemic rolls on, so we're in month five, um, so I've noticed a trend. So the shock, um, some in the denial, and now we're into what month five is summertime. A lot of the um, young women are like getting out more, um, and now really are dealing with some things um, and are seeking mental health. So um, I provide virtual, um, you know, groups to individuals. So a lot of uptake in that, a lot of anxiety and depression um, around again, like we're all wondering about what's going to happen with our future. So for them, um, being distressed and disappointed about typical adolescent um, milestones that were missed, such as graduations, mm -hmm. um, family celebrations um, around the holidays, um, and just doing things that they wanted to do. So no graduation parties, no cookouts, no Mother's Day, Easter, um, in the spring, you know, rolling around in the summer. So really um, having to deal with this major change um, that we've had to deal with. Um, and just like the rest of us, increased time with family has caused um, conflict. So whatever was not going well um, in the family um, continues not to go well. Or even for some of our young people, it has been a good time for them and their family to work through some things. So um, it's provided um, a time um, for those things to either get worked out or escalate. Um, and also, they're doing a lot of help, just as like we talked about um, helping their families out a lot. Um, because, you know, their families need it. So they're doing a whole lot more cooking, um, more taking care of younger siblings. Um, and so they're really just, you know, stepping up to the plate um, as young women and really kind of help their family really make it through this difficult time. Um, some other um, COVID-19 implications have been loss of employment. So our young adults who um, have like retail jobs, hospitality jobs or restaurant jobs, have been laid off or furloughed, um, which is, and they, a lot of the times, contribute to the household. So that's um, um, been a stressor for them, um, as well as those students who were in school. So those young women who are in high school um, or in college, um, we know around spring break, everybody was kind of like abruptly, um, you know, removed or, you know, from the campuses they were attending. And um, so that was a struggle for some of our young people. Some of them did really well. Um, some of them struggled with being, um, having to finish their um, semester online. And then now we're looking at the fall, everything's about like, what are we gonna do with schools, whether it's college, high school, K through 12. Um, so a lot of our young people like really, you know, kind of up in the air about what's gonna happen, trying to decide should I go to campus? And we actually have some people like, I'm going to give it a try because I really need to get away from my family. Um, and if, if nothing, if it doesn't work out, my family said they'd come and get me. So really helping them to um, kind of navigate those things. So this is kind of what I've noticed um, really briefly with the young women that I work with. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. And it's, it's interesting to hear your perspective, especially around, uh, you mentioned that there was increased adherence. And I thought, I would have thought it would have been the other way around that maybe people are too. more afraid to go to the doctor or to, you know, leave the house and go to the, you know, pick up their prescription or whatever it might be. I don't, you know, I, I would have thought it was different. So it's interesting hearing that. And then also, yeah, we've been seeing all those missed out, miss, uh, people missing out on graduations and all those things, which has been really unfortunate. Uh, Adrian, have you seen things that are similar or what, what have you noticed in terms of Absolutely. Um, a lot of my youth are, are fearful of returning to current jobs that are in high risk areas. So like a lot of my kids work at fast food restaurants and they're like, oh, I don't want to work there or they're stocking shelves at a local grocery store. So their issues is if you're not supposed to leave the house, then why am I supposed to leave the house? And why am I supposed to help you get what you need? So it's like, no, I don't want to keep this job, but then I need this job for my livelihood, or this is my only opportunity to actually leave home. So a lot of the kids were kind of fearful with that. And then the other one was access to resources. We're in DC. So a lot of my kids were like, um, the shelves are empty. What do I need? And it was my turn to buy groceries this month. And now there's nothing and we're fighting over toilet paper and we can't find hand sanitizer. And is it okay to actually make vodka, Tito's and tequila as hand sanitizers? And I'm like, please don't put that on any parts of your body. <laughs> so just the kids really trying to understand what it was at first. Uh, I think they didn't take it seriously until some of their peers started to become sick because it was this notion of it doesn't affect youth in the beginning. And then, oh my goodness, somebody had tested positive that I know. And then, oh, it actually can affect us. And so that coming full circle was just kind of like, oh, this COVID thing. So I'm not exempt from getting it. And I do have to be out in this world with everybody who actually has this thing. And like Dr. Bryant was saying, so I can't go to the cookout. So I can't Netflix and chill with my boo. Like school's out. If I'm not in school, then what am I doing all day? And you know, what am I supposed to be doing? And like, oh, we need to do something or social distancing. What's that like? So me and my 10 friends can hang out, right? And it's like, no, not really. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> Because, you know, and so trying to navigate you through that was was a hard thing. And it's like, I get it too, we're adults. I don't want to stay in the house either, but how to help them and navigate them through that process has been a little challenging. Yeah, we yeah. definitely get this has been more challenging for our young people to navigate their way through um, our new COVID-19 new era. Um, this is such a great conversation. I do want to mind, remind everybody that this session is being recorded and it'll be available on both health healthhiv.org and febarryinstitute.org after the panel discussion. If you guys want to listen to this again, I just wanted to make sure to put that out there. Um, such a great conversation um, so far. I'm so excited about that. This is finally coming around. Um, so I, I have another, have yes, go ahead again. Um, I just want everybody to know that all the opinions that I express today are solely my own. They're not reflective of my employer because I'm going to get real with you guys. And so I don't want everybody to be like, oh, she works here or she used to work here. It's all about personal, professional experiences and speaking to you all as a, as a Black woman who's been in the field for, I mean, I may look young, but I've been in the field for over 15 years. So just letting you guys know that what I say is what I say, and these are my words, and I'm going to get real with you guys. And I want that to be part of the learned, shared experience. Thank yeah, you. I, I think that's one of the things that make this panel so exceptional because, you know, there's four black women and we all have such different perspectives mm -hmm. and we come from such different places. So I think that that makes this a really rich panel. Um, so we're gonna go on to the second question that I have. Uh, what are some of the specific health promotion and disease prevention needs for black youth and emerging adults? Um, this can also be secondary prevention for those living with HIV. Um, so I just want to actually pose that question um, to us post to Adrian first. So Adrian, again, what are some of those specific health promotion and disease prevention needs for black youth and emerging adults? Um, definitely, we're gonna start with education and awareness. Um, in my previous work, I've done some work with uh, PrEP and PEP and U equals U. So for those who don't know, uh, PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis and PEP is post-exposure prophylaxis and U equals U equals undetectable equals untransmittable. This is all for HIV. Um, and so youth don't understand that. Um, and so we're not putting a lot of money funding and campaigns into educating our youth. Uh, so our youth are like, what is PrEP? What is PEP? Is this a thing? What is this thing? And then if I did introduce the topic to my youth, then they're like, oh, my mama told me that Tuskegee, and I'm not supposed to take no pills from you guys. So then we're talking about medical mistrust in the African-American communities. So how do we combat medical mistrust along with education and awareness? It needs to be represented 
So they need to see people like them. And I always say, if Beyonce could just do one prep commercial, we would, you know, combat youth HIV rates, right? So if no one looks like them or they're looking at uh, commercials and the person does not look like a heterosexual, cisgender, black female, then yeah. why do I need to take this medication to prevent me from HIV? Um, and then also disclosure, right? If my friend is HIV positive and they're not telling me, of course, they don't have, they don't have to, but if they're not telling me that, then I don't think it affects my community. And so they're, they're youth walking around like, oh, I don't know nobody with HIV and I ain't going to get that. And it don't come here east of the river and southeast and it's not, it doesn't <laughs> affect me. And I'm like, if you only knew that there's somebody who has a story and a testimony to share with you would be so important. Um, and then the other thing is understanding transmission as far as STIs are concerned. A lot of my youth have no idea how, what, where this happens. Um, an experience, a personal experience from a previous job. I'm going to get a little vulgar, you guys, but this is part of me being real with you guys. I had a patient who had uh, chlamydia in the back of her throat, unaware of how she got it. Previous social worker comes in and says, are you having oral sex? The young lady says, I ain't doing no oral. And so she's like, okay, are you engaging in fellatio? Like, what's going on? And so- Did she say, what's that? She was like, what fellatio? No, miss, I don't know what that is. So I come in, true New Yorker. I put my hair up in a messy bun and I'm like, listen, mama, let me talk to you real quick. Are you sucking dick? And she's like, yeah, because I don't get pregnant if I suck dick. And I was like, okay, great. So let me explain it to you. Now let's use this as an educational tool. So anything that enters your mouth, ha you know, is transmission of fluids. Did you swallow? There's a little bit of pre-cum. What the process was. And she's like, oh, I do that so I don't have to have babies. So there was a, a complete disconnect between the first social worker who spoke with her because she wasn't speaking the same language as the the as myself and so when i come in and i'm using words in terms that she's familiar with instantly i was able to explain transmission so she's like oh no one ever told me that that's exactly right. how i can get this or that so educating you they don't know that they can get you know something in their eyes and you know something in the back of their throat and then as we always say what parts of your body are you using to engage in sex so i can make sure that i'm testing all those areas you know, because I had a girl who was like, I don't need doing in a buttness. And I'm like, okay, great. So let's do a rectal swab. And let me explain to you what a rectal swab is. But thank you for telling me the spaces and where you, how you're using your body to engage in sex. Um, and so then that's just the, definitely an important piece of understanding it. So if we're going to talk to youth about just disease prevention, what it is, how it's transmitted, what parts of my body can be affected, and really just having that open and honest conversation. Granted, we know we need to call it the right names, but if there's a disconnect and they've never been told that, then we need to make sure we're educating them what the name is so they can understand the two. Like, oh, so a penis is a dick? Got it. Oh, okay, they're the same. Right. And once they have that connection, then, or fellatio is oral, okay, and oral is in something entering my mouth? Got it. And then we can begin to educate. We shouldn't just assume those assumptions right, that they know what we're talking about when we need to make sure that we're properly educating our youth. Mm -hmm. Adrian, thank you. And I can tell you our viewers surely agree because I yeah, get everything yeah. from yes to yes to go girl to everything else because it resonates and if we're, you know, um, providing um, services, you know, we have to connect with that community. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Bryan, um, can I get your take on that as well? Again, I'll repeat the question. What are some of the specific health promotion and disease prevention needs for black youth and emerging adults? So I echo what Adrian said um, in regards to using their language. Um, I know when we're in a professional setting, it's hard for us to let, you know, take off that um, armor or, or use different language. We think it's not professional. But for me as a professional, it's like, how do I reach you? Like I need to, we need to be on the same page, the same language. Yes, I know these words and I want you to know them as well. So to me, it's about the connection. And like, I think we need to go a step further than um, it's important to know about the transmission and how to keep ourselves sec safe, but also about enjoying sexuality. And I think that is missed, especially for the HIV positive young women that I work with, or if they get an STI, it's more, it's not, explicitly said that it's a punitive thing like hey you should just not have sex because you are hiv positive you should not just have sex because you have an sti of course if you would have to wait till your sti clears um but for me um i find a lot of the young women that i work with um really um don't know much about it they think well i can't have a kid because i'm positive and the kid is going to be positive and i already have issues with my mom because 
this, this this disease is transmitted to me um or like wow everybody else is having sex and enjoying it but i'm always afraid because i might you know pass this on to somebody and then they don't protect themselves because they feel like um hey i'm just happy that somebody you know is with me they have this damaged goods quote unquote mentality and so they don't feel empowered to negotiate condom um use with their partners they don't bring it up because hey if i bring up a condom he's gonna think i have something and if i have something um then he's not gonna want to have sex with me or if he he likes it better without a condom it feels much better without a condom then i'm gonna miss out right, right. on my opportunity to be with this person um, and they don't want to because in adolescence, all you really want to do is fit in. Even though you want to be different, you want that acceptance, <laughs> right? Um, so it's a push and pull of that. And what I find with especially a lot of the young um, African-American women that I work with that are positive, the fear of, their real fears, of course, of violence, of not being accepted by your partner if you disclose your HIV status, but not even just fear of um, negotiating, um, can you use a condom or like what that means, um, for them and so i just think that the conversation around prevention especially for hiv positive young women um should be more empowering to include um joy um to include that this is a normal part of our humanity as a human as a woman um as a being to have those desires and to fulfill those to desires to explore those desires um and so so yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and I'm sorry. And so I see a lot of the comments coming in and, you know, and I see that what you're saying is really resonating, but it's okay. And it's a good thing to feel pleasure. <laughs> you yes. know, that's a good thing. We can feel pleasure, you know, and um, that is something that I don't think our young people are getting enough of that message. I'm sorry, Hannah, to cut you off. You want to say something? No, that led perfectly into the question that we were going to ask next. Really, it was a, around like conversations around sexual pleasure, or you know, Adrian, you talked a lot about language and how you use the appropriate language. True social worker, meeting them where they are, and that's so important. That's so important. Exactly. Um, so this piece about sexual pleasure, I wanted to go into a little further because our girls within this age group told you know that it's okay. Like, do they know that? you know, do they know anything really about sexual pleasure or that it's okay to, to know your body, be familiar with your body? Do they know about any of this? And where do these discussions happen at, if they happen at all? Are they talking with their providers? Are they just talking with their friends who probably don't know anything more than they know? Or where do these conversations right. happen? And, and how can we, you know, create a space for those kind of conversations to exist if they don't? I think we definitely need to start with normalizing sex, right? kids are going to do it. Humans are going to do it. Just like Dr. Bryant said, it just starting with the basics of it's, it's happening. I think oftentimes we kind of shun youth and like, oh, you should wait until whatever notion that we put in their head, marriage, graduation, prom, whatever, adulthood. And so if we start normalizing the conversation of, yes, you are a sexual being and this is going to happen in life, then we can transition into, okay, so sex and pleasure is a thing. And understanding that guess what? Pleasure is going to happen. Pleasure is going to come. Instead of putting our youth into spaces where they're saying, oh, well, I didn't experience pleasure or my first orgasm until I was 30. You know, I have a friend who's like, I'm 27. And I just found my clitoris. I was like, sis, it wasn't missing. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you mean you just found it? It's been with you this entire time. So understanding like, let's look at your body. Let's look at what this begins. So it starts from the beginning of understanding how our body works, understanding that pleasure is definitely something that's supposed to happen, that is all-encompassing, and then now speaking your language. Okay, so yes, you may not want to use the word vagina. What's comfortable for you? Now let's have this conversation. How are you using your vagina? Are you using it for pleasure? We always miss that piece of masturbation, right? Because that's taboo within itself, but it's about exploring your body. Just like it's like, oh my God, I got a mark on my arm. The same way you should say, oh my goodness, I have a clitoris. <laughs> they, they, they go hand in hand. So we want to make sure that we're, we're doing that. And then for our providers, checking our biases, right? I like to say, check your stuff. Because if you're saying, oh, you're not supposed to have sex until you're this age, you already put this, this my young black female in this bubble of saying, well, she's having sex too early, right? Coming from a person who had sex and still had a pediatrician, I'm like, oh, well, I'm, I, I can't tell you that I'm having sex because you're going to judge me, tell my mama, whatever the process <laughs> is. So now I'm like, uh, I ain't having sex, I ain't having sex. And so then later it's like, 
I've been having sex for a very long time. Uh, so, you know, and now we've missed things, right? You should have been testing for STIs. You should have been doing everything. So if we normalize the fact that youth are having sex, got it, everybody, they're having sex. Okay, we're done. Now let's move on to how do we help them through this process of sex? Um, a lot of young females get uh, misdiagnosed from endometriosis because we're not saying is sex pleasurable? Are you having pain during sex? Are you achieving orgasms while you're having sex? So a lot of providers are missing that component. And so my, personally, I have a cousin who didn't get diagnosed with endometriosis until she was 23 when she's been having painful sex and you know harsh periods so the provider missed that because it was just like oh i'm not going to ask you these questions even if they are on a flow sheet to ask you so we kind of skip that process and skip those questions and then also like i said speaking their language if you're not comfortable speaking their language then maybe your nurse should speak the language. Maybe there should be someone in the, the practice who is comfortable in speaking their language to make sure that we're normalizing the fact that youth are gonna have sex. Because my black babies are having sex and they just want people to, to be accepting of the fact that they're having sex, not judge them and be ready to answer the questions that they may have about sex and their body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's usually some sort of negative thing that comes along with sex. You shouldn't do it. It's dangerous. It's painful. It's bad for whatever reason. But we don't really talk about the other side of that. And what's also interesting is I'm seeing in the comments that a lot of people are saying that uh, this is something that comes up later in life as well. Even with the older women, we don't talk about sex. We don't, you know, maybe in the 60s, 70s, never achieved orgasm or whatever that looks like. Imagine that these conversations should probably have happened much earlier on in the lifespan and there we have so many missed opportunities for that. Um, Yafet, did you want to add anything there? Is there anything else that maybe we can do to start approaching these conversations in a better way at younger ages? Um, I agree. I just think that we have to realize the power differential um, and check our own implicit biases as providers um, because a lot of times um, I'm speaking like psychology ease, but the, the kind of transference because we might look like a mom or an auntie or somebody that, oh, I can't talk to you about that. So we really have to, so it's not our job to impose anything about morals or religion around sexual behavior. I know it's all tied in and that's not what we're talking about, but what we're talking about is how can we help young people who are exploring and engaging in sex, no matter what we think about it in our own personal lives or what their parents think, is what's actually happening. And so right. we can kind of push those things aside because we really want to serve as a space for them to be able to come to. Um, and like, it's not a one-time conversation. And so that's what I think missed. So I just want to add to that because a lot of times we think, let's have the talk, whether it's a parent or the pediatrician, uh, we're just going to talk to them one time about um, their period or sex. Um, it's very sterile. Um, it's not very um, connected or engaged. It's around like, this is what it is. Don't do it. Um, and if you do it, I don't want to know. Or if you do it, go get a birth control pill or use condoms. That's it. And then youth are left to themselves to navigate this. And sometimes they don't have the best information. They don't know. And so I just want to encourage us um, as a, adults to be a part of the thriving. So we try, we try to teach black girls, all we, we teach this how to survive. And so this is about the thrive, changing the narrative, dismantling, dismantling this whole thing. We're just trying to make it through with super women. Like there's joy in our lives. So really trying to, at a younger age, change, turn this thing around, reclaim our bodies, reclaim our sexuality, um, in a way, and so we just want to be able to help the generation that's coming up now not to have these same things, not to wait till have to wait until they're 30 to have an orgasm. Uh, yeah, but I love what you said, especially beyond surviving but thriving. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to move beyond that point and you know, just encouraging and po you know, positivity and and thriving. So, um, I love that what both of you um talked there, it was great. Um, we're going to move on to um, as black youth, are black youth included um, in conversations around sex and sexuality? So are black youth included in these conversations around sex and sexuality? And I'm thinking the answer is probably no. <laughs> so my follow-up to that would be, can you speak to the significance of language here and how to approach this conversation? And Yafet, could you please go first this time? Um, just like Adrian's been saying, we're not including them. How we are including them is very limited. Let's put it that way. Um, we just, we kind of interrogate them. It's kind of like questions like, 
Are you doing it? Who are you doing it with? What'd you do with that boy? What are y'all doing, right? So it's more than about um, conversations about what are you thinking about? What are you curious about? And I just think um, that the conversation needs to change beyond, I just want to know if you're having sex so right. I can know if you're pregnant or whether I'm going to, where I need to test you for STIs. I understand all that is very necessary and important, um, but around, um, you know, being more curious and like really kind of like the stigma around being a sexual being um, starting to break that down. Um, I know we don't want our young people to, our young women to be exploited or to have sex when they're not ready or being taken advantage of. I get that. But if we don't have those conversations, um, they won't know when that's happening. So really having more conversations around what are healthy um, relationships? How is it help, you know, so they don't know. So when they're approached by maybe older men or people who are predatory, they don't know the difference because they are seeking certain things. Of course, they have limited experiences. And if we're not open to having these kind of conversations with them, that puts them at risk or makes them, excuse me, more vulnerable to maybe those types of situations. And so I think these conversations also serve for that. Like, hey, if I have a question about, um, hey, you know, um, I'm just interested in this guy, I really like kissing him. And then when this happens, I feel this, you know, we need to not be afraid to have those conversations um, because if we don't, other people will. Mm. Right. Yeah. Thanks for expounding on that. I know Hannah asked a similar question, but you know, um, there's a lot there um, for um, for us to in, unpack there. Um, so I surely appreciate um, appreciate your feedback on that. Adrian, you have anything else to add to that? I can go on to the next question. If you have something else to add, please do share. Keep it running. Keep it going. <laughs> Keep it going. <laughs> so um, let me ask you guys: what are the what are some of the key psychosocial challenges? faced by black adolescents um, that you both work with? Um, um, I'll go first. Since, okay. <laughs> uh, so so um, in terms of the young women that I work with who are HIV positive, um, and this is, doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't apply to other young women, but just that's the population that I work with. Right. Um, so again, a lot of low self-esteem um, and self-worth because they are HIV positive because of the stigma around living with HIV. Um, like I talked about before, uh, feeling like they are somehow damaged, they're somehow unlovable, nobody will accept them, and that's all we want any person, you know, to, to be accepted in love, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, dealing with a lot of breaking that down, um, really helping them manage that, or really trying to change their paradigm around that um, is really a lot of the work that I do under all of it. Um, Medication fatigue, a lot of, for youth living with HIV, they've been taking medication since they were um, forever. Since right. they were like, you know, babies, they've been taking medication. When they become adolescents, parents are like, it's on you now, you have to take your medication. What do people do during adolescence? They don't want to do what their parents said a lot, right? And also, you don't want to be reminded, a lot of young people talk about being reminded, young women, that I'm different from other people. I have to take this medication because I'm HIV positive. I want to forget about it. I just want to be a normal teenager. I don't want to take medicine. Um, so they're fatigued with it. Um, it's, a, it's a reminder of something that they want to forget. Right. Um, a lot of anger and depression. Um, a lot of them face that and anxiety around um, various things along with the typical teenage issues um, along with, well, I have this secret. I have this thing that I can't tell people. And if I tell people, you know, they'll make fun of me, um, or they'll shun me. Um, um, it's real. It's real. And also some anger, to be honest, with our perinatally infected youth, anger toward their mother. A lot of unresolved anger. Some of them have lost their mother to, to AIDS and have been raised by other um, relatives like grandparents or aunts. And so there's a lot of grief, a lot of anger. This is not fair. I did nothing but be born. Right. Um, and now I'm living with this um, and now I have to deal with this and you expect for me to be perfect with taking this medication every day and all I want to do is just be like everybody else um, which is totally normative um, and then um, in regards to where I work um, they have to transition like to adult care so they've been coming to let's say the same provider all of their lives and they're like I don't want to leave 
So even though, you know, they, they fuss with us about taking medication, it's a family. So it's right. another loss. Um, it's another transition. And, and they don't deal well. Some, some of our young people don't deal well with that because they still right. are grieving the loss of their mother. They're dealing a lot with HIV. It's very stigmatizing. I don't want to go to another group of people to have to tell them all of my story. I don't want to tell my story again. Like, right. I, don't want, I don't want another new group of people to know all of my business. Right. Like, y'all know all my business. I don't want these people to know. Um, so, but it's really hard. And it's also a part of just adulting. So that's part of growing up and adulting, which is difficult. Um, so those are some of the things that, the top few things, there's so many things that my, the young women that I work with um, experience. I see some of mine is um, peer pressure. We, we kind of forget that in, in our African-American communities, like she got a mind of her own. She's going to, you know, make her own choices. But if my friends are already having sex, I kind of feel the pressure that I need to start talking about it, exploring it. And I don't have somebody I can kind of talk to and confide in. So let me Google educate myself on, on something that it may or may not be accurate. Um, and then the, also the need of being hypersexual, right? A lot of my young ladies got body got potty parts that are shaped different and look different. So this notion of having to be hypersexualized. Um, it's summertime, right? If she wants to wear her short short and her hips are nice and you know things are looking different, we must also remember that she's 14. And now she feels like, well, if the guys at the carryout are, are talking to me and I'm walking past the barbershop and they're thinking that now maybe I need to engage in this and I need to keep up. So this constant race of wanting to be acceptance, wanting to fit in, thinking that they need to keep up. So instead of saying, it's okay, you, you don't have to do this and, and you only do it when you're ready and understanding what consent looks like. So just the life in the world that they're living in now, my youth are just kind of like, I'm supposed to be having sex because my friends are and I saw a TikTok challenge where I'm supposed to do this or Instagram said this or these videos have this and Cardi B's like this and my youth are just so jaded by things in society that they're just like, I don't think they take the time to stop and think of who they want to be. It's what does society say I'm supposed to be? Um, as a black young woman, if my mom had me at 15 and my grandma had her at 16, generationally, I'm on the same path. So at 17, I'm going to do the same and be stuck in this, you know, generational, I don't want to say a curse, but this generational thing of us having kids young or having sex early. So I think realistically, we're not realizing what's going on in the spaces that they're living in. And we're just kind of thinking like, oh, all kids are the same. Absolutely not. Like, it's just not. And our black babies are not the same from their counterparts right. whatsoever. Right. My baby's got their own kind of issues, you know? And then we have kids who are, you know, food security. Like, I'm, I'm actually, engage, I engage in sex early because I need to help pay the rent. Or, you know, this person gave me a place to live because my mom strung out on drugs. I don't want to go into the system. This person said I could live with them for a small fee of sex exchange. And, you know, so, so many other things that our youth are being faced with that we tend to, especially as adults, we tend to forget that, listen, I didn't grow up with a camera phone. So I don't know that if I take a picture of myself and send news that there's ramifications of that too. So understanding the times that they're growing up in is completely different than where we are and, and understanding they, they've got some stressors too. They really do. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's interesting that you're talking about the times that we're living in and the influence of social media and celebrities. And it's just kind of like sensory overload. Like there's influence coming from everywhere now and it's even worse than what it was before. And how do we manage that? And many of us older don't necessarily understand the whole, all those different influences and where they're coming from and, you know, where to kind of, address these things and so that's that's really interesting and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up um, and then also Yafet you brought up the piece about internalized HIV stigma and you know negotiating condom usage and then Adrian you're talking about sex as currency and there are just so many issues that right. are sort of circulating that that young people have to navigate while also trying to figure out who they are that's just so much that's so heavy time. and in a system that's inherently racist which is just so yeah. much to even comprehend or even try to to deal with at one time um but since we know all of this and we <laughs> trust all of this what do we do now and what what would we advise folks that are working with young black girls particularly uh whether hiv positive or, or not living with hiv um what would we advise uh clinical providers non-clinical providers or young young girls themselves like what what should we do now you know what's next 
moving forward? And I would, I would start with Adrian and then we'll go to the FX. For my young girls, definitely find that person that you can talk to. We call them trusted adults in the community. Finding your trusted adult, whether it's a coach, a teacher, guidance counselor, social worker, your doctor, an aunt, a cousin, somebody who can provide you with that accurate information because they're going to have questions. Um, for my providers, if possible, creating spaces where there's a reflection of these young Black women that you're serving. So even as small as the receptionist looking like them or the tech who's taking their vitals looking like them, just this diversity piece is important, but I'm not going to feel comfortable telling you what's going on in my body if nobody looks like me um, because I feel like my body's different and it's my own. And then making sure we're actually taking the time to listen do not assume that they live in this area and they're already engaging in sex. Cause I think that's a lot of things that providers do. Oh, teen pregnancy rates in the African-American community are skyrocketing. Let's look at birth control. Right. And then when we look at birth control, we immediately put them in LARCs, long acting reversible contraceptives. So our IUDs, our next planons, right. And we're not asking them, well, are you even sexually active? Oh, you're 15. You need to go on this or doing that. So stop assuming how their lives are and making sure that you're actually taking the time to understand how their life works. She, they could be having rough periods. So we may want to look at pills and skipping pills so they can stop their periods or lessen their flow or, you know, whatever it is, but making sure we're taking the time to listen to our youth. I know it's a money game. It's a systems game. You only got 15 minutes, but in that 15 minutes, ask them how they're doing, how their relationship status going, what's new in social media, how, what they eat for lunch today, really, really making it about that one-on-one -on -one experience so they feel comfortable coming to you as a provider, whether that's your therapist, your PCP, your gyno, whatever it is, just making it an inclusive environment for you to feel comfortable speaking to you about what's going on in their bodies. Yeah, that, yeah, that, is, that, that is just so, so true. And I see the comments coming in and, and one comment that came in said that parents are many times requesting that their kids, their daughters be put on birth control. So those conversations right. need to happen within um, within our households. Absolutely. You know, so that's an important point. Um, uh, I know we have a few more questions. I just want to let participants know that you guys could start typing your questions in the Q&A box, and then we're going to reserve the last, let's say, last 20 minutes for, for Q&A, and uh, we, all, we do have the ability to go live with that. Uh, so, Hannah, I know we have a few more questions, and, and if um, Yafet, I wanted you to add to to that as well before we move on. Okay, I'm sorry. I just so really quickly, I just wanted to add about pathways for, especially for um, providers. Um, just to really be curious, I think that will um, take care of a lot of it. Like, really be curious, not treat this person because they're a certain age or a certain demographic a certain way. Really be curious about their experience. Um, like, go and refresh eyes. Um, I understand that, you know, we have certain things that we have to do, but really be curious about that young woman. It'll go a long way. Um, in terms of Black women, young Black girls, um, some things we can continue to do is to continue to reclaim our bodies as a whole, not this the sexual part, the reproductive part. I think that when I, I know I find it to be annoying that when you think about women's health, we only think about our, our, our reproduction health. We have a whole entire body. We have hearts, we have lungs, we can go on and on and on, right? So let's think about our health, physical and mental. So let's think about our whole body, um, not this, those parts that make babies or whether you want it, whatever it is, or you have sex. But let's, let's think about our whole selves, right? So let's reclaim our bodies, continue to heal from this negativity and the racism and the sexism that has been going on for centuries regarding yeah. our yeah. bodies. And um, all black women. Yeah. And how that has impacted us. So how has that yeah. impacted us? How we show up in the room, in our families, in our relationships. Yeah. So let's be honest with ourselves about how those things have impacted us and how we um, then convey that to our young women. So we need to check ourselves as well around sexuality, yeah. um, our varied expressions of sexuality um, and sex. Like check yourself, what do you think about oral, anal, vaginal, um, you know, pansexual, bisexual, lesbian, all of those things. We need to check ourselves um, around that. Um, and to really just make sure that you work to be a safe haven for our young women. So you can be, you know, non-judgmental. You might not have all the answers, but they need places to go, as like Adrian talked about with the trusted adults. Um, we really need to like have more spaces for them to be able to come, not to be judged, not that you fast, why are you out here doing all of this? 
Like we really need to um, really be those soft spaces for us to fall because we fall into that same trap of, hey, we're strong black women, we're gonna survive, don't do that, let's not be right. Let's be a safe space for our girls to come to. Yes, you know, we need a balance of that because we, we know how to be hard, like girl, you gotta do blah, 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 blah. But let's also um, be that soft space for them. That's all I wanted to make sure I got I love that, I love that. And um, that's a great note to end on, Hannah, with the mm -hmm. panel discussion. I see our time is ticking away. Yeah. Um, so, um, Hannah, are there any questions that you see that you would like to actually pose to one of our panelists? Um, one person, uh, oh, are we gonna open the, the lines? Is that what we're suggesting? Um, we have a few minutes. Uh, we would like to, to try it. Um, to see if we have a few enough time for a few questions. We would love to hear our, our we would love to hear some voices um, If we have uh, some time for that Okay, I'm, I'm scrolling through now and I'm seeing several comments and a few questions I see someone here talking about social media can aid in getting out accurate information as well I think you know, we kind of talked about the other piece of it as being sort of a distraction or being uh, something that can negatively influence, but social media can also be used as a platform to share appropriate information to meet them where they are, and they are on social media, right? So I think that's a really good point. Um, it's hard to scroll through all of them, so let me see. So you guys, um, just in these last few minutes, if you have any questions that you want one of our panelists to answer, um, uh, Dr. Brian or Adrian, um, please um, type that in now, um, and please let us know who you would like to answer that question and that we could go live on some of these um, last questions before we um, end our wonderful panel for today. Well, Lisa, Lisa, I see some questions in the Q&A box, if you guys wanna field those. Yes, those in the Q&A box. Okay, there we go. Thank you for that, because now I see those. I was looking in the chat, okay. <laughs> So, okay, this is a really interesting one here. Um, Maria Shagog, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, so this person is asking, are, well, are PrEP and PEP proven to be effective among women? Um, it's not posed to anyone particularly, but I suppose anyone can answer here. That's such a loaded question because the research will say, yes, absolutely. And then some research says, uh, the dates, so we understand that uh, people who are biologically born female, so cisgender females, um, the time that it takes to, to actually be effective in the body is a 28 day time frame, as opposed to those individuals who were born male, it's a seven day time frame. So we're talking about retention, we're talking about making sure you're taking the pills same time, same day, um, every day. So it, it wavers, but it has been proven effective for, for females, but then it's all these other, well, how long and how long do they need to be on it? But prep for women is definitely been uh, proven effective. Short answer. When you say that you're talking about the time span for before, how long people need to take it in order for it to be to start working? Right, correct. And it's 28 days for uh, individuals who were born as women. Okay. I don't know if Yafet wanted to add anything there. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we've got another question here about. Um, I don't know how to open the line, so I'm just asking. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Hannah, I, I don't think I do either because okay. we have an ability okay. for them to actually interact with us, but I okay. think um, that we may have um, some. Here's some another one uh, from Michael Wilson. How do we balance the importance of meds for those youth living with HIV or youth on PrEP, PrEP slash birth control and avoid uh, adultivizing black girls? It's a great how question. Do we, how do we balance the importance of meds and avoid adultifying them? Um, I think, I know we deal with it um, every day in our practice. So really trying to empower them. So as adolescents, they're seeking, one of the tasks is to seek independence from their parents. So they're beginning to, they're starting to do more things on their own. Um, and so part of that is they take, um, you know, they kind of get buy-in of like, I'm older now, I can do more things. And so part of that is, so one of the things you do to take care of yourself. So what I tend to do is couch it in wellness. So, right, so you want to be well to be able to do those things, like whether it's, you know, being on this sports team, being a cheerleader, being in these clubs, like doing all these activities and having all, doing all the fun things you want to do as a teenager. Um, this is the thing, this is one thing that you have to do really quickly, like take this pill so that you can stay well. 
right? And so that's how I like to manage it because they're like, they don't want to end up in a hospital, um, you know, because of an AIDS complication. Um, so they're like, hey, well, okay. And um, one thing I also tell them is, it's okay to feel your feelings while you take your medication. Let's deal with it. Let, let's not let your viral load increase and your CD4 go down um, while you're angry or you're sad. Um, come talk to me. Let's come and talk about it. Let's deal with it. Um, because we really don't want their health to suffer. Um, so really making sure that they understand that. Um, and I know it's a hard because it's, it's hard for adults to do, but um, we also offer a lot of support around adherence um, and also letting, you know, being a safe space for them to fall. Like, it's okay. I get it. Right. Mm -hmm. And if they do get off track for them not to be penalized for it, for it not to be a lot of harshness and abrasiveness around them falling off, if they fall off their adherence, it's a normal part of what happens and let's get back on track. And so that's how um, I tend to handle those um, types of things with medication and HIV positive youth. Okay. Um, another thing that came up here is around uh, sex educators. So this question comes from Nicole Holmes and says, as sex educators, how do we advocate on behalf of our youth to teach pleasure in a sex ed curricula when the school, the school board, the PTA, or parents in general might not be on board and they might not want to talk about those things? So how do you advocate in that kind of a situation? That's definitely a, a tricky topic because, like you said, there's so many other red tape, red lines, but literally the word pleasure is never banned. So letting you know that pleasure is supposed to be experienced through sex. I think that people kind of become hesitant when they say, oh, you're going to talk about pleasure as if we're going to show them this is what feels good and touch this and do that because every pleasure for everybody is different. So uh, what we tend to do is just explain that pleasure for everybody is different. It can be just the way somebody holds your hand or kisses your neck and it doesn't have to be as intimate as people are thinking pleasure actually is. So it's about what feels good to you first and then experiencing that with somebody else. So just making sure that, yeah, curriculums may say we may not talk about pleasure, but understanding that pleasure is a, one of the key components of it, and then providing yourself to be that safe space to then have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Again, not saying go behind people's backs and you know going against parents and teachers or whatever, but kids are gonna have questions about what pleasure looks like. So letting them know that, yes, I'm a safe person. I can be your trusted adult to talk about what pleasure looks like, but it is a part of, a natural part of sex. But it's so hard with curriculums. We can't go into school like, girl, you should be feeling this and you should have three <laughs> orgasms because maybe that may not be, you know, what their, their, their yum may be. Uh, their yum may be, you know, little elbow touches and, you know, playing with my ears. And so understanding that pleasure looks different and just letting them know that will kind of help combat that. Right. Something that you just said, Adrian, like about being that trusted adult is related to another question that came up. And we talked a lot about that. I talked about the importance of being that safe space or the soft place for people to come or young people to come ask questions. So Sherry mostly here is asking, what are approaches that are used to build trust for young people so that they can speak freely? What exactly can you do as to become that trusted adult? Mm -hmm. Dr. Bryant said it earlier, be okay. curious. Ask them about who they are, what they're going into, and the conversations will segue. Um, just literally, hey, so what's going on? How are you feeling? And, you know, I'm here if you have any questions. And don't be the awkward person like, so you want to talk about sex today? Like, that's not the best way to start the conversation. I'm your trusted adult and I know everything. <laughs> like, all right, you're weird. I don't right? really know. <laughs> you know, and then also bring it, bring it back to self, right? If you have a personal experience, like, so. I noticed you're about 16 and you know, what are you guys doing now? Cause when I was 16, this is kind of what we're doing. Let them know that you've had similar experiences. If you did, please don't lie to our kids. But if you did have similar experiences, let them know like, well, you know, at, at 16, I had a boyfriend and you know, we became sexually active and the kids are gonna be like, oh, for real? Okay, good. So, you know, again, self-disclosure as a social work is only good for the greater good of the, the, the client or the person you're serving. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but understanding that that opens doors because now you look human. And, and you look relatable to youth, right? Um, and they want to know that I can talk to you instead of like, oh yeah, well, go talk to the pastor. And it's like, uh-uh, pastor said we're not supposed to have sex and so we, this is this age. And how do I know this person is a, a warm and welcoming person for me to speak to? So really just opening yourself up. Start having those conversations with youth and letting them know that I can be here. Um, even small things, like if you guys work in organizations and just say, trusted adult. It's not a phrase that I coined. It's not an organizational phrase. It's an actual phrase of trusted adults. So identifying yourself as a trusted adult and saying, I'm somebody you can talk to. Being that person who has like condoms in, in your office or in a fishbowl or wherever your location may be, because it's like, if they're giving out condoms, they, that person might be a little cool. Can I stick my hand in your condom jar? And it's like, oh yeah, well, so 
by the way, I have a question about this. And so <laughs> presenting yourself as such, um, to just, just be open and to have the conversations, but kids, kids know who they can talk to. They're, they're good at scoping that out. They know that either we're full of it or I, that's not the person to talk to. You know how they always say kids are such a great judge of character. Yes, they exactly. Know. So they know not to come to you. That's not your thing. <laughs> um, and there was an interesting um, question that came. Um, culture can be empowering and limiting. How can we help? Dr. Bryant? I guess I'm trying to really understand that question. I, I think I get it, but then I don't. I'm not quite sure. Culture can be. Say it again. Our, our cultures in the community, it can be empowering, but it also can be limiting. Um, the cultures within, with the cultures where our Black youth actually live, grow, and can be empowering because mm -hmm. as Black communities, we have this great cultural history, you know, but also can be limiting. So I, I think that's a part of being a part of the Thrive, right? Um, so for me, um, from the space where I am, I always want to expose my young people to different things, whether it's different ways to think of thinking, different um, experiences that they may not have. Um, because I find that the youth that I work with, you know, they live in a, um, even though they have social media and they have the world at their phone, right? Um, but again, their, their lived experiences can be very limited. Um, and so really trying to help to expose them to different ways of thinking about things, um, whether it's different foods, um, different places. So really that helps expand the mind. Um, and so really like being a person that can offer something that's different from somebody that looks like you, because we can kind of get stuck as that, like this is not what we do as black people, as black women. Oh, that's what, oh, you trying to be like other people and you're not so that they can know that the world is their oyster. Like there's no limit on how you can experience life um and what you can do and experience and so i think if we as trusted adults like be that example be that lived example um like even with yoga like i even had some kids who started doing yoga during covid before they're like oh that's kind of like so and so like but if they saw it like if they came to the hospital and they're like oh i was like oh right before group like hey they've been doing yoga in here i was like i think i might want to try that right so really um, helping to open the door for them and, and like kind of like letting them know that it's okay. Like people like us do various things, right? And that doesn't mean we're less black or more black or whatever that might be. Right. Um, and so whatever you need to do to be well, whether that's mental or physical, um, I'm for it. <laughs> um, and so like being like, you know, saying that that's okay and exposing them to different things. I'm not sure if I answered the question, but that's- Yes, that's you did. Point. And you answered it beautifully. <laughs> and um, that actually is a great note to end on. Let me tell you, this was incredible. And I just appreciate um, Dr. Brian and Adrian um, accepting on the first ask <laughs> from Anna and I. Mm -hmm. So we are incredibly grateful and uh, we're looking forward to our part two and three. We only have about two minutes left. Listen, guys, there were so many great comments. We thank you for all the love that you guys have sent our way and all these great comments and questions. And how and I looking forward to part two and three um, as we move on because this is a whole series. So this conversation just continues, you know, so stay tuned. Um, so this is the last slide with our panelists. This is just another slide. Reminding you guys how to actually um, obtain your credits. Um, please visit that website. Please do not forget to send your evaluation. And even if you are not claiming credits, we will love to hear what you have to say. And trust us, we will be back because this conversation needs to continue. There's so many great implications. And, you know, I just love that Dr. Brian, you and Adrian were just, just the best panelists. And um, I thank you guys so much for all of you contributed to this. And Hannah, my friend and colleague, you always just do just an incredible job. And um, I just enjoy working with you and look forward to part two and three. I know we have just some very few minute slides. We do want to um, let you guys know about um, Health HIV Synchronicity Conference. Please um, look at that slide and please register because we're gonna have some, this conversation is gonna continue in SYNC 2020. We have some really great um, black uh, women presenters, and we're going to be talking about some really great things. So please make sure you guys register for that conference. Um, Hannah, if you could just click some of those slides. These are our sessions and plenaries. 
We're gonna have 50 track sessions. We have great speakers and on really timely issues. We are also uh, offering credits for that. So that is always a plus for our providers. Our five plenary sessions that we're gonna have and these are those plenary sessions with a lot of rich conversations. So we look forward to that. Um, and, we, and these are our 13 tracks, really great things. Stuff, stuff, stuff around social terms of health, and substance use, women, health, diversity, workforce, criminalization. These are going to be all great topics. We're going to have a great conversation. For that, um, our seven institutes and that the, the generational health and women's health is going to be great. I'm running those, <laughs> but it's going to be great. We hope that you guys come to that, you know, in our first virtual conference. And especially a special section of intersectional stigma and access to care. This is going to be really great. It's going to be a great conversation. This is a really great and timely topic because as we said, stigma, unfortunately, is still alive and well. And lastly, oh my God, yes, our women's health track. We're going to have a Black Women's Health Institute, September 9th and 2 to 4. Please, please join us for that. We're going to, it's going to have just great conversation. And these are women health track sessions, um, end of the epidemic by improving women's health literacy, engaging women in HIV care, and addressing disparities around women to end the epidemic. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. And um, stay tuned, and we will see you tomorrow. Same time, same place. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.